My name is Ross King. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Austrian Institute of Technology in Vienna. Uh, and I'm the leader of a research field called, the research field is data science, and the research group is called uh, the Digital Insight Lab. Um, the reason I'm here today is, well, first you heard from Victoria's talk about uh, Bitcoin and how uh, Bitcoins are uh, used a lot by shady characters to carry out even more shady transactions. And we've had a number, I think we're on four projects now in the past three years uh, about Bitcoin forensics and working with law enforcement to solve that problem. So I have a lot of experience uh, with bit blockchains with regard to virtual currencies. Uh, and more recently, we have joined this project called Data Market Austria, where we've also started to act with other aspects of digital current of, of blockchains, and that is smart contracts. Very quickly to say who we are, Austrian Institute of Technology, if, if you know the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Germany, we're the Austrian equivalent of that. So we're not, we're not a university, we're, we're kind of a national lab, but we're a funny national lab with this 40-30-30 business model. That means we have 40% funding coming from the government and the rest we have to get either in the funding market or in direct uh, uh, commercial markets. Uh, yeah, 1,300 employees uh, in eight competence units. I come from the competent unit, uh, competence center, digital safety and security. And I'm not even important enough to show up in the organigram. We're just part of the uh, business unit information management. That's the, how, how much research priority gets, we get at AIT. Okay, so that's, that's enough. My group, we're about 20 people uh, and working in various areas, uh, I'd say about half of us working in the areas of uh, blockchain-related technologies. Okay, that's why I'm standing here. In addition, it's, I'm going to talk about this project called Data Market Austria. Uh, that was a so-called flagship pro project of the FFG, the Forschungsführung Gesellschaft. So it's the equivalent of the BMBF maybe in, uh, well, no, that's not correct either. It's a funding agency in, in, the, uh, in Austria that deals with applied research as compared to another funding agency that does uh, uh, theoretical research or basic research. Uh, this project was conceived in order to create a data services ecosystem. And the idea behind that is open data, yes, but not only. So on one, at one part of the, of the mission of the project is to provide a platform for open data, but another aspect of the project is to provide uh, business models, legal support, and infrastructure for uh, business based on data that's not necessarily open. It could also be proprietary data. So that is, let's, a big uh, example is uh, one of our big mobile providers, mobile telephone providers in Austria has a huge data, anonymized data set about the movement of people with their cell phones in Austria. And that could be an interesting input for a number of products and services predicting uh, tra traffic in uh, commercial areas, how many people you expect knowing where to send a taxi and what, at what time of days and so on. So they'd really like to be able to monetize that data, but they can't give it away, not only because it's proprietary, but also because of general data protection regulation considerations. That's, so that's part of this uh, mobility uh, pilot. Project is, it's a three-year project. We're coming exactly to the end of the first year. It's, it's coordinated by Research Studio, Studios Austria. Alan Hanbury is maybe a name you know. He's coordinated a lot of EU proposals, uh, EU projects. Uh, our part is leading the Work Package 5 Data Technology Foundation. Here you see the project displayed in a kind of graphical view, the four uh, areas and the 17 different partners, which are RTOs like AIT, universities, Actually, we don't have universities in this project, strangely enough. It's almost all the research institutes instead, uh, industry and, and, and small industry as well. Those four areas correspond to these four goals, and I'm only going to talk about the first one, advanced technology foundations. Research and develop the technology foundations building on blockchain technology in the areas of data handling, service, and brokerage. brokerage. So this isn't exactly an archive. Um, Although there is a great interest in the aspects of long-term preservation, uh, but it's more of a data management system. And we formulated this question in our, in our proposal, how can you use blockchains to support such a system? So now I come to the meat of the talk, blockchains for, and smart contracts for a data ecosystem. 
why, why would you think of using a blockchain in this area? I think there are three primary reasons, and I think you've gotten the idea from Victoria's talk already. One is about the veracity of the data. How can we be sure who provided the, the data to the infrastructure? Well, the blockchain allows you to have transactions that are signed, so uh, they're irrefutable. <laughs> if, if, I, if, I, if I find a transaction with my uh, public key signature in, in the blockchain, I cannot deny that I put it there because there's no one else that's capable of putting it there. And since you have this indelible transaction history embedded in the blockchain, you have a good mechanism for provenance. Again, as Victoria pointed out, it's a provenance all about bits and not about, not about contextual information, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Then there's a question of integrity. How do I know that the bits haven't been changed? Well, we've been hearing hash, hash, hash <laughs> all, all morning. Yes, that's one of the fundamental technologies uh, used in, in, in blockchains is hashing. Hashing of the material, hashing of the transactions, hashing of the blocks, hashing of the signatures. It's, it's all over the place. It's, uh, it's, it's used constantly. Uh, but this is how you know that if I put a transaction in the blockchain, it's not been changed, it's not been altered. How you marry that with the integrity of, the, of, the, of a document or a data set itself is another interesting problem because you don't want to store uh, a document in the blockchain. You could store a document hash in the blockchain. The document has to be somewhere else, and then here we have uh, this problem of the, what was it called, the archival bond that needs, to be, uh, that needs to be solved. And then there's another interesting aspect, sustainability. We're trying to build a, 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 an ecosystem that will survive beyond the end of the project, and for that to be achievable, it's important that we don't have any dependencies on one particularly strong partner or one industrial partner that might be driving it now, but you know, when they're purchased by some American company in five years or more likely a Chinese company in five years, uh, and suddenly that's no longer a priority. We still want this thing to be alive. So that's the advantage of the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of the blockchain. In principle, there is no central authority, uh, and this thing can live on regardless of which members come or go or, or, or stay with the organization. Uh, Victoria mentioned earlier there's this problem that a private blockchain, which this will be, uh, is not decentralized in the same way as a public blockchain. And if I may expand on that a little bit, what that means is in a private blockchain, when you're first building up the chain, somebody has to figure out who the founding members of that chain are. And whoever that person is has a lot of power. I get to say who is in my exclusive little group when we start out. Uh, and that's actually a problem we're trying to address uh, in this project as well. OK, so that's why we might choose blockchains as a technology. <laughs> Now, keeping in mind, blockchain itself means it's an abstract idea that concerns a kind of how, how certain protocols are implemented. There are many implementations of the blockchain. Bitcoin is an implementation of a blockchain. Ethereum is a different implementation of the blockchain. There are something like, just in the virtual currency realm alone, there's something like 800 <laughs> virtual currencies out there, most of which were forked, copied from Bitcoin. But there are some new ones coming up as well, things like Monero, Zcash, that use uh, higher levels of encryption and different, uh, different proof of work mechanisms, for, perhaps. So those are really different implementations. We needed to decide which implementation would we choose to build our blockchain on. And what were our criteria? First of all, we wanted to open source. We're trying to build a business model here, and we don't want to encumber that business model with some kind of licensing that would make the whole project dependent on a company like, I don't know, IBM, if we were buying to Hyperledger or any of the number of uh, companies out there that are trying to sell their, their blockchains. It needs to be relatively mature, though, because we want to build a productive system on top of it. Because it's open source, there's no real company behind it. Community support is crucial. Otherwise, when you run into a problem, you'll never solve it. And there should be, of course, a strong support for smart contracts. Because not only are we trying to manage things like membership in a fair way, uh, but there's also the idea that the whole legal aspect of I wish to have access to your service or data set should be handled by a smart contract, not simply by uh, acceding to some uh, terms of use online or by having some external paper trail. No, it should be done through smart contracts. Those were the criteria. And what was our decision? Ethereum. Why? Ethereum is open source. It's a new public license version three. If you're aware of what that means, it means it's, uh, it you can't change it without making your changes also open source. 
And if you try to bundle it with another product, you have to make that product also open source under the GPL3 license. This is for us not such a big problem because we don't intend to alter Ethereum in any way. We're only going to deploy our own blockchain based on Ethereum, so we're neither selling it nor, nor uh, altering it. This is not a, not a hindrance. Maturity. Uh, next to Bitcoin, it's probably the most mature uh, blockchain implementation out there. And here, mature really means it's in the, it's in the public realm being used by uh, lots of users, as Victoria pointed out. There's something like 20,000 nodes. Actually, when I checked right during your talk, it was 24,000. Uh, but that's a very volatile number. It changes on a day or hour by hour basis easily. Uh, and yes, there have been problems. You've probably read about the theft of millions, uh, $50 million worth of ether uh, associated with, uh, with, with the blockchain. So, but the point is, that's the kind of uh, flaw that can only be discovered if you've been running publicly for several years. All these companies that are saying, oh, we've developed our own proprietary system and it's super safe and it's super secure, I have to ask them, how do you know? How do you know that until it's been tested in a large scale environment where a lot of people are maybe interested in stealing real money or real value? Okay, so that's, that's the maturity part. It has a very active community. And with regards to smart contracts, uh, I need to amplify a little bit on this point. So the real innovation behind Ethereum is that it has a smart contract language that is Turing complete. Uh, I have to contradict a little bit what Victoria said earlier. Bitcoin came first and it has a smart contract language. However, that language is not Turing complete. And what does that mean? Turing complete means that with your programming language you can reproduce any algorithm, any conceivable algorithm. That was the genius of what Turing proved uh, with certain types of programming languages. You can re create any kind of machine. In Bitcoin, this is not the case. And to make a very simple example, in Bitcoin, there's no such thing as a loop. And since there's no such thing as a loop, you cannot create an infinite loop. And that's a good thing if, if you're trying to process a bunch of contracts over a whole bunch of different nodes. You don't want all those nodes to suddenly be sent in an infinite loop and crash your whole uh, ecosystem. Ethereum, on the other hand, allows loops. Ethereum allows you to do anything in the programming language. So how did they get around that? Uh, they had to introduce this new concept called Ether. So Ether in Ethereum is not just a virtual currency, although it is trading like a virtual currency. It is the engine, it is the gasoline, it is the Treibstoff behind all the transactions that occur in smart contracts. And this is how they solve the infinite loop problem. I can't make a program run infinitely because I have to pay Ether in order to make that program run. And if I run out of Ether, the program stops. But that means in order to do anything in the, block, in the Ethereum blockchain, I have to get Ether, which means I have to do some, some kind of thing. And that sort of thing is I'm mining some Ether on my private local blockchain right now. And in order to make my demo work, I have to do some background work. I, I made the mistake of not starting that mining soon enough when, when my colleague was talking, so now I have to do it during my talk. What am I doing now? I am going to deploy the contract, the smart contract, that that manages membership in my, uh, in my Ethereum network. When you work with Ethereum, it's, everything's asynchronous. I send a request to the network, and that request has to be mined by the other uh, nodes to be validated. And this actually, in, in, a real, in the real live Ethereum network, just like in the Bitcoin network, that can take between 10 and 20 minutes. In my local network, it only takes between 10 and 20 seconds, but I'm the only one participating in it. So now I have to let my program know that that's the address of the contract so that I can carry out my demo. And that, that, that address, it's not exactly a public key, it's the hash of a public key associated with the, uh, with that account. Okay, now I should be able to, I've got two windows open here. I should be able to run my application. Okay, I hope I'm up and running. 
Uh, also, a big drawback, like, like Bitcoin, Ethereum relies on a proof of work uh, consensus model, which means all the nodes that are actually mining are carrying out this senseless uh, guessing game at finding hashes that have a certain property. And I, c I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear it. My CPU is running at 100% right now, playing that guessing game with itself, coming up with hashes for, for my blockchain. So it's not very efficient. It's not energy efficient. And, but again, as Victoria pointed out, there are other consensus mechanisms. And in particular, for a private blockchain, you can have much more efficient cons consensus mechanisms because the security requirements are not as high. Uh, ether, gas, proof of work, right. The final thing is so-called anti-scaling. What do I mean by that? When I carry out a, an operation in a smart contract, that operation is duplicated on every single node in the network. That's how you achieve this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, consensus. Everybody has to check the same thing. They check that the algorithm was carried out properly and that you got the same result. If you got a different result, then somebody was tampering and that transaction would be rejected. But what that means is, no matter how many nodes I add to my network, I will have the same amount of processing power. I don't get more processing power by adding more nodes. On the contrary, it stays flat, whether it's one node or a million nodes. That doesn't scale. Furthermore, in the words of the Ethereum founders themselves, that, that entire network has the processing power of about a smartphone. And not today's smartphone, but a smartphone from 2000s. So you cannot, even though you have a Turing complete com computing language, which should allow you to do really cool things like uh, machine learning algorithms or uh, encryption algorithms and so on, you don't want to do it. <laughs> It'll take forever and will cost you too much ether. It's good for very simple operations like, mm, I'm going to move this amount of something to this over here. That's, that is fine for. Or I'm going to have a vote and count up the votes. It's good for that. Don't try to run watermarking on an Ethereum network. OK, what would our Ethereum network look like? It's what I would call a hybrid peer-to-peer -peer network. Why? Because yes, there are a lot of these, uh, there'll be a lot of nodes. Each one's running an Ethereum instance. Uh, and they're all connected in this peer through this peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Huh, but there also will be a central node. And why is that? Well, OK, so what, what do the provider nodes do? They provide local data management. So they store objects and metadata locally. They in index that information, and they run the Ethereum node. The central node is the, is the, provides the federated search. I still would like to be able to find content, find the data sets, find the services that have been deployed over the entire network, not just over one local node. So there we have a central service that basically harvests the indices of all the other services. That's also where we're running the website, which would be the central access point for people who want to find out about the service, join, and so on. And then there's something called the bootstrap node. And this is kind of the lie of peer-to-peer. -peer. Because in order for a peer-to-peer -peer network to work, the peers need to know how to find other peers. And the simplest solution for that is to have, oh, have a central node called the bootstrap node that everyone can go and look up to find out where the other nodes are. Which is great, except now all of a sudden you're not really peer-to-peer. -peer. You have a central point. Now to be fair, it's not exactly a central point of failure. Because if that node disappears, all the other nodes can continue working just fine. They'll, they still know about each other. The, the network will continue. Uh, but when you want to add a new node, <laughs> where, how do I inform that new node where the, all those other new nodes are such without bootstrapping? <coughs> OK, so running locally on my machine, I have two nodes. They're running in Docker, by the way. Docker is a lightweight form of virtualization we call containerization. I recommend it. It's very, very useful for development. We're using it in all our projects now. It's like two virtual machines. One's the so-called bootstrap node, and one is my mining node. And here's, here's what all the things this node does in close-up. And poof, there's a lot of information here. Uh, what do I want to point out? There are two kinds of members. There's organizations. Well, no, that's the only kind of member. Organizations are members of this network. Organizations have agents that are human users that uh, opt that can instigate contracts on behalf of that organization. Both of those types have so-called EOAs, externally owned accounts. Those are the addresses, or those, well, they're not the wallets. They're the, they're the addresses, the accounts that are necessary in order to do anything on the blockchain. 
And then we have three different kinds of contracts, four different kinds of contracts. The membership contract itself is a program that keeps track of who is a member of the system. The license contracts are the ones that give the terms and of, and of conditions of use for services and data sets. And data set and service contracts are basically data structures that contain a, a minimum amount of metadata about data and services uh, in the blockchain itself. Because a membership ac account, an EOA, only has two attributes, an address and how much ether that address has, nothing else. So you can't, can, you don't have enough information in that to keep track of something like, oh, what's the hash of this particular data set? So I need, for that, I need a data set contract. I know that's complicated, and I know this, this talk is technical, but I think if you want to make an informed decision about whether to even explore blockchains for <laughs> your institution or for archiving or for whatever use case you're looking at, you need to have some technical details. Okay, the final thing I want to show here, again, details aren't too important. Again, just how I want, I want to explain how we want to solve this archival bond problem. So on a given node, we have a data management system and we have a blockchain node. And those reference each other through these EOAs. So all the EOAs of our data sets, our users, and so on, are also stored in the metadata system. And this is, and there, there's the additional metadata, perhaps including the contextual metadata necessary for long-term archiving is stored there. And it's all through this, this referential system that you have, have this connection. The problem is, of course, unlike a real database, there's no referential integrity. If someone goes and deletes stuff there, how do you inform the blockchain? Those are all uh, research questions to be addressed. Good, now I hope to do a short demonstration. And with, with the caveat, of course, that it's live demo and everything can go wrong and probably will. <laughs> I already showed you this, which is the monitor of my local blockchain. It doesn't quite fit on the screen because of the screen resolution, but if I scroll down here, you can see I've got two, well, or not see. There are two nodes, the bootstrap node and the minor node. You can tell which one the minor node is because you see that 33 kilohashes per second under the, under the pickaxe. A kilohash. So I'm, this weak computer, which is running Docker inside VirtualBox on a laptop, can manage 33,000 hash calculations per second, which is pretty bad. It wouldn't get anywhere in the real world with that kind of rates. Uh, for that, you need stuff like GPU clusters to come anywhere close to making any money with Ethereum or Bitcoin. But I don't need this for my private network. And in fact, it's an important aspect of my private network that I can decouple the creation of Ethereum from any money in considerations. Because if you get money in there, if our, if our users could suddenly say, oh, instead of uh, trading data sets, we could actually just use this system to mine Ether and get, make a bunch of money. No, we don't want that. So that's another important reason why it's a private system. You can see up there in the corner, I've already mined 327 blocks since I started this thing about 20 minutes ago. Okay, so keep in mind the idea, the, the, the question I'm trying to solve is, hmm, let's try that, better. Uh, how do I build up my network in a fair way so that the founder doesn't have an, an enormous amount of power? And I, our idea there is through this voting membership contract. So presently, uh, if I log in, We have exactly one member, the founding member, Research Trees Austria. Uh, we have only one user, the administrative user. Uh, we can look at the balance. How much ether does Research Trees Austria have? Who? A lot. That's in way. A way is uh, an atto ether, so one times ten to the minus eighteen ether units. And actually, when I was programming this, I didn't realize how small a way was, and I was trying to figure out why is it so small. And I couldn't find the answer in a short time, but I suspect it's the following. It's an amount of, amazing amount of optimism on the Ethereum founders, because what they believe is an Ether is going to be worth millions of dollars. And so, since I want to have transaction costs that are many millicents or microcents, I have to have a unit of transaction that's much, 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 much smaller than Ether. I think they're a little overconfident, but okay. Why do I have so much ether or whey? Because I've been running the block, I've been running the miner all this time, and as uh, Victoria pointed out, the reward for mining is that I get ether or Bitcoin, but in this case, ether. So this count is 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 constantly uh, bringing up ether. I can check here for pending votes, 
Any candidates? No. Of course there aren't because I haven't, haven't done any applications yet. So now I'm going to apply for my own organization, AIT. Some of you know my colleague Sven. He's also working on this project. That's why I'm choosing him as my representative. So uh, what, what this does though, it allows me to vote for members uh, and when the, new, when the new member is approved by the existing members, now he, he allow, is allowed to vote in future uh, votes. And it's a majority rule system. So in this way, we have a democratic election of new members rather than some kind of uh, centralized decision who gets to be a member. So in that way, it's still as decentralized as possible under the private uh, blockchain model. And just to conclude, uh, the first year was about specification, uh, both of the overall requirements, the technical design, the blockchain design, and right now we're in the prototype implementation, and we're actually supposed to have an online system in month 15, which is in January. I'm, <laughs> given the state of the demo, I'm skeptical, but okay. Thank you very much. Demolition. Um, that was very informative. Um, great to see it actually in action. I think that gives you um, concrete understanding. And I think the technical detail in Ross's talk also very helpful. Uh, just before we have our next speaker, any questions? We can take one question right now and then we'll, as I say, come back to the panel discussion to any further questions. So, anything else for Ross? While we're getting ready for our next speaker, we'll be pulled up. Yes. I was, wondering, <coughs> I was wondering about if you could give us more details on your smart contract to elaborate a little more. What would you like to know? So um, the, the smart contracting language is called Solidity. It's based on JavaScript. So if you know JavaScript, it's very similar uh, functionality. Uh, it has some interesting properties. Uh, if you, you can define a lot of uh, public variables that can then be accessed through uh, transactional queries on the contract. Then it has methods that can be uh, activated through transactional queries. Um, and as I said, it's all asynchronous, so it's necessary for your uh, smart contract to register to, to create events. And then my program here it has an event listener that looks for things like, oh, somebody registered to vote, or the vote has been decided or yeah, things like that. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. I, I can show you the example if you want to look uh, at some of the lines. Come on. Great, thank you so much again, Ross.